it's time for a project, a project where I take lots of crap off eBay and then merge it all together and make some new piece of crap that's completely functionless but fun to make. So I've chosen this time, I've chosen an LED lamp and I've done various things with these kits. These are kits that you can get where you build an LED lamp. You get all the components needed for the power supply, the base, the little cover that doesn't normally have a big hole in it. The hole is there for another reason. Uh, but you populate it with LEDs, you build the power supply, you put it all together, clip the lid on, and then you've got a custom lamp with the LED of your choice. In this case, though, uh, the reason for the hole is because I'm actually going to have some LEDs on the circuit board, but I'm going to have some of these little uh, leads that you can get pre-made from eBay surprisingly cheaply. These are commonly used in sort of like model aircraft or drone type projects. And I've come across this connector in the past. Is it a JH connector? Can't quite remember. I shall, I shall provide links to some of these things in the description down below. I shall try and provide links to everything, in fact. But uh, these connectors, I remember seeing these being used on these ornate floor lights that were on sale in places like TJ Hughes in Glasgow, which is a sort of a home hardware type store. And they had these big ornate floor standing lights, which were made from sort of a metal frame with coiled metal wire wrapped around it. So it was just this mass of shiny copper, not copper, but sort of chromey steel wire. And intermixed with that, the main source of light was lots of these little sockets looped in series with LEDs in them. And I'm guessing the reason that they were using these little sockets instead of the hardwired LEDs is because it let them change LEDs. It means you'd, because it, it, bear in mind this was in quite a large light fixture. But the downside to that was I followed, traced the wiring from the outside of one and, and there were an awful lot of them in series suggesting it was a capacitive dropper, which meant that these little silver contacts here that were just shoved in amongst the coiled wire were potentially live. And likewise, if one of the LEDs get pulled out partially, it could also bridge onto that sort of mass of metal the thing was made of. wonder how many of those actually came live. Laterally, I noticed they switched to just standard fair lights. But anyway, I digress. The point is that I'm going to be having a bunch of these sticking out the top of this light. And I'm going to put some blue LEDs on the circuit board itself, but I'm also going to have these, 50% of them are going to be these things coming out. And then I'm going to be using these green candle LEDs. Let me show you a green candle LED off eBay. If I plug this into the LED tester and I press the button, you'll see it does that flicker candle flame thing. It flickers up and down. So here is a slight caveat. You couldn't just put all flickering LEDs across a capacitive dropper type circuit. And I'll show you why. In this case, uh, I'll doodle the thing out, but I'll doodle it out quickly. You've seen uh, thousands of capacitive dropper circuits in my channel because I, they're just in everything. But here is the gist. There's a capacitor, a discharge resistor. I won't even write any values in. We've got a bridge rectifier, which in this case is discrete diodes. I'll just draw one big diode. Plus, minus, there's a smoothing capacitor. So this capacitor here lets through a portion of electricity in each half of the sine wave, and that pumps up this, it keeps this capacitor topped up. There's a little resistor across there that's irrelevant, it just uh, provides a slight load, makes sure that lights go off quickly. And then, apart from the fact there's a rather oddly placed 10 ohm resistor here, which is really odd, uh, after that, the LEDs aren't just in one continuous series circuit like you'd often find. They're actually branched out into pairs of LEDs like this. So there's an LED, there's an LED, loop together, and then it goes on to the next pair. Uh, you may hear noises in the background. It is blowing a hooli on the Isle of Man, as it so often is. We've had Storm Dennis has passed through recently. Um, but to be honest, it just looked like a typical day in the Isle of Man. So the LEDs are wired as bunches like this. I think there's about 38 sets on here. Uh, 38 LEDs, so that'll be uh, 15, about 19 sets. Is that right? I think it is. Uh, 19 pairs. If you try to put the flickering LEDs directly across, a big series string of them across the capacitive dropper, it would cause problems because... When the LED is off, and keep in mind it is, it's pulsed modulated, it's ramping up and down. When it's off, it would effectively open circuit and it would see quite a high voltage across it. 
So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a standard LED. I'm going to use a blue one in the base, and then I'm going to use the flickering, let's just write FG, flickering green across that in parallel. The blue one will act as a sort of cap for three volts, and then the flickering LED, it means that when it's open circuit, it just means slightly more current will go through the blue, and it keeps the voltage capped. This is also why you get those RGB colour changing LEDs that do the sort of, they go red, green, blue, red, green, blue, and then they do strobing effects. They can't really be reliably wired in series across a capacitive drop because they do go open circuit while they're flashing. And it means that the voltage crossing goes up really high and it could damage the circuitry. The ones that do the very slow transition, transition the red to green to blue to cyan, magenta, yellow, they are designed such that the they aren't actually off at any point. If uh, green is off, or if it's at half intensity, say for instance if it's in cyan, then blue will be on at that point in time. It's quite a clever bit of design. But anyway, I've digressed. This would then go through multiple hours and then come back there. That's the circuitry. While I'm doing this, because it's going to take a while, I'm going to be reading more questions that were asked by Patreon supporters. So here's the gist. Uh, the soldering iron is on. I'm going to dump some of these LEDs out. I'm just going to start populating this. Now, before I started, I put a little green dot between pairs of these things because it's that white circuit board material. It's very hard to see uh, the tracks on them, so I had to sort of work it out which pairs were common. I should mention this is not a safe project. Very few of my projects are safe projects. Uh, it does carry a slight risk that if... Uh, you know, if someone's playing about these LEDs while the lamp was plugged in, they could get a bit of a tingle. But that's no great surprise, you know what my projects are like. They all have a tiny little element of danger. So I'm going to start by soldering these LEDs in, one at a time. One in each pair. I'm going to make sure I get it the right way round. Yes, I am getting it the right way round. There's a flat marked on the LEDs, the flat uh, denotes the cathode of the LED, the negative. It's also got a slight flat in the package. I've just stuck the solder iron off the plastic dome there and probably left a big skid mark on it. Not to worry. Right, questions while I'm soldering this. Maybe I should actually solder more LEDs at once. Uh, Jack Jack asked, Hi Clive, could you explain things to look out for when using imported electronics like the soldering station with the loose earth lead? Want to stay safe while still getting stuff in a budget? The primary thing I'd look for is that the earth lead was connected first. Don't trust anything that's supposed to be low voltage but uses a switch mode power supply because so much of the stuff from China is a complete death trap. I'm not sure why they do that. They just don't seem to understand the concept of keeping the 240 volt or 120 volt side away from the low voltage side. It's just... A, a very Chinese thing. They just seem to... Maybe they learn at a young age not to mess around with electronics. Maybe the babies get a good wallop early on and, and discover that electricity is not fun to poke with little baby fingers. But for us, we're maybe a bit over-sheltered, so we're unwise to sing things like that. There's a good chance that if you had a power supply that was faulty and it was putting mains out in the low-voltage side, you could go through your whole life play about that thing and not get an electric shock just because there was no reference to ground, but it's it's something you should uh, still allow for. Complex subject should cover that in more detail at some point. Right, let's uh, sit this down. This is going to be very, very footry. I'm kind of regretting doing this this way at this point in time, but not to worry. I shall just shuffle these LEDs and I shall loosely solder them and then just reseat them with a fresh bit of solder. So I'm only soldering one lead at a time initially because I want to make sure they're all square and then reset, reseat them. So what I'll do is I'm putting a splash of soda on these leads and then I shall uh, finish soldering them and then I'll just lift it up and I'll put my finger on the other side to hold the LED straight and I shall reflow the solder. Has that me got them all yet? Yes it is. Right. So I'm just going to go and put my finger on the other side, reheat the solder joint and just line that LED up while the solder is reflowing. 
It's just a easy, lazy way of doing things. Making sure that you keep your finger in place until the solder has recooled. Next question, asked by Wim, who says, Hi Clive, what are your thoughts on the future of energy production, sustainable energy, fossil fuels, fission and fusion? Well, they've not quite got nuclear fusion pinned down yet, if it's even viable. Time will tell, I guess. But uh, fission nuclear reactors, I'm okay with them. But not huge, all your eggs in the one basket nuclear reactors like Chernobyl and things like that, or Fukushima. Uh, I'd prefer it was much smaller reactors, lots of them. And uh, those reactors were actually managed by people who weren't just labourers who had been put through a one-day slideshow presentation and then given a white lab coat, as happens. It's all about the look, the theatrics of making it look like super-duper nuclear technicians, but in reality they don't have a scooby what's happening. That's not a good idea. Then again, I have to say, for a technical person, it could be quite boring working in a nuclear power station just waiting for something to go wrong. That precludes companies that are owned by members of the House of Lords and other, say, the the White House parties in America, the big corporates that... Uh, are part of the government that uh, build a nuclear power station and then staff it with their own companies using the cheapest labour possible. That happens. That's probably why most nuclear incidents have happened. Uh, they did a spectacular thing in the UK in the early days of nuclear power. Uh, British Nuclear Fuels, was it, uh, offered disposal services where they basically charged for Putting the nuclear material, the plutonium, I guess, uh, in concrete underground bunkers. But then, uh, as soon as the concrete underground bunkers started breaking up and failing, they immediately went bust, therefore divulging themselves of liability. And uh, they uh, then possibly started up new companies helping dispose of it or resolve the situation using, again, cheap labour sent in and white paper boiler suits to uh, basically put themselves at risk. Mm. Nuclear power. It's fine if done properly, but not fine if not done properly. Wind power. Uh, there's lots of wind here at the moment, but the Isle of Man does not have any wind turbines. The Isle of Man generates its power partly through oil-powered uh, generators, and partly through burning our refuse. But uh, it's a modern era type sort of refuse burning system, so it's not uh, it's not such a high risk of stuff going into the air, nasty sort of stuff getting burnt, and they've got quite intense filtering systems to remove that. But the, the Isle of Man is apparently self-sufficient in power, which is quite good, although it does have an underline, undersea line to the mainland, which it can use in both directions. Right, let's put this down and start soldering more. Let's uh, shuffle it until those LEDs sit into place and flow some soda. Uh, fossil fuels, I'm not so keen on coal and stuff like that, partly because I don't think people should be sent down in mines. Fission, fusion, that's more or less covered that. Wind power, the, uh, uh, Scotland has wind turbines, lots of wind turbines. And uh, they're always giving it big licks. Glasgow is surrounded. Glasgow is kind of in a valley. And it's surrounded by wind turbines. And on weather like this, Scotland will be exporting a lot of power because uh, we have far too much power in Scotland from the wind turbines. But the wind is not always there, so you always have to have some backup system. Solar isn't too great in this country mainly due to the lack of sunshine. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of the reason I'm doing this project is because I'm a bit under the weather at the moment. I was in Glasgow, I've come back with a dose of the the lurgy, a cold. Uh, so I'm just bidding myself in pointless projects because, well, that's kind of fun really, isn't it? But yes, Scotland has uh, good resources, natural resources. It's got hydroelectric power. It's got uh, wind power, lots of wind power. Not a lot of solar power because uh, solar power is best left for places like parts of America 
and Australia, where they get tons of sunshine. India, I suppose, would be pretty good for uh, solar power as well. But the same solar panel in on the Isle of Man would generate a fractional amount of power. It wouldn't be really viable. That said, maybe they can just compensate for it with, uh, with quantity. That LED is a bit wibbly-wobbly, but that's all right. Let's go on to the next one. Almost there with LEDs. The static blue LEDs. And then I'll move on to the uh, the little leads for the remote LEDs, the flickering ones. Next question is... What is your biggest annoyance with people? Says Patrick Michael Lee. What is my biggest annoyance with people? I've not really got much annoyance with people except the people who don't really contribute to society. The parasites, the freeloaders, the ones that don't just... You know, I'm fine with people who don't contribute much to society because there's not enough work to go around. But the ones that damage society, the parasites... I don't like them. People who destroy society for their own personal financial gain and exploit people. Humans are fascinating, but there's a dark side to that as well. But there's a positive side as well. We're fascinating creatures. With lots of animal traits from the past. Quite fascinating, really. Uh, that is Nat Saldren. There's soldier now. Some of these soda joints are a bit ungenerous amount of soda. That's largely because they're plated through holes and it is dragging it through into the hole. That's all right. Um, next question. Nanny Isabel, does using non-gendered plugs sound like a good idea for power distribution? Not really because, although it might sound like a good idea, using plugs like these leads, which are... Both sides, the plug and the socket, are both shrouded, so you can't touch them. The downside of that is in power uh, generation and distribution, there's a risk that you could end up accidentally plugging two generators together or multiple phases to get... Well, this should be keyed, but plugging a couple of generators together in a sort of loop-in, loop-out type connector could result in much as bang us. So it's not necessarily a great idea, although it would be very tempting. It'd be nice if you didn't have to worry which way around the leads were, particularly when you've run a big heavy cable in and you realise that you've got the wrong end of it. Shall we just sweep these leads out the way? Next question. Uh, well, where are we? Let's... Uh... Ah, Steve Lemon asks... Do you think the current environment of political correctness is doing a disservice to our young people? I just can't imagine being an 18-year-old snowflake apprentice turning up the first week in the job. What's really doing a lot of damage to the young people? The young people are not the snowflakes they're painted out to be. What is doing a lot of damage is the fake training that's been given these days. How the health and safety executive has created a horrible culture whereby... You don't need to train someone to be an electrician anymore. You can send them in a one-day slideshow presentation called Safe Electrical Isolation or something like that and then say, well, they've been trained. They should have known better. And it's kind of de-skilling industry and it's cheating people out of a proper trade. They're not getting the proper apprenticeship they used to get, which is a shame. It's, it's, it's going to damage society in the long term it's going to it's not a cost effective way of doing things it's just a very shallow way of making a quick buck by using casual labor to do work beyond their ability and making up for it with fake qualifications that's the biggest concern apprenticeships are not what they used to be which is a real shame that said i still recommend wherever possible get an apprenticeship There are companies, notably facilities management companies, who work on the basis that they don't want to pay their workers much money and they will just basically give them crash certification in a multiple range of things. But those people will never, ever have a good deep understanding of those, which is a shame. Because there are a lot of really talented individuals that are expected just to learn stuff in their own time and it's not the same as getting a proper formal technical education. I was lucky there. 
I did my apprenticeship in a time when it was at the peak of uh, good apprenticeships, I suppose, really, is the best way to describe that. Very deep technical knowledge in a wide range of areas, from power distribution to mercury arc rectifiers. This is looking good so far. Let's solder those other leads. And that will be all the blue LEDs soldered in. At this point, theoretically, I could hook up the power supply, and because every second LED position place is filled, it should light. But I shall wait till I finish the project first. Righty ho. So, where are the connections? All right, okay, I'm just checking the things out. While I'm on the subject of uh, technical questions, things like that, I want to mention there's a YouTuber called Steve Summers. He's got a very, very educational channel. He is a machinist, but a very skilled machinist. And uh, he takes projects from saying, fixing something, he'll actually make the specific tool required for the machining equipment to do that repair. I'm just going to keep an eye on the time here so I don't roll over the 30 second gap. Okay. Uh, and Steve Summers uh, recently released some videos. It's fascinating watching him. It's really quite relaxed and enjoyable. He recently released a video which uh, he'd been keeping a little secret about his uh, workshop. And the workshop is kind of subsiding. It's not in a good condition. I think he did what I did when I was young and uh, when I was looking for a place to live, I chose just the biggest place I could afford at the slight expense of the neighbourhood it was in, which turned out actually quite good anyway. Uh, but also, the uh, it was a, you know, it's an old wonky old tenement. But I wanted the biggest space I could get for the money. It wasn't fancy, it didn't even have central heating, didn't really bother me because I worked outdoors anyway. And, uh, you know, it pays off really, just to, you know, you, you get a larger space for your workshop and stuff like that. In the case of Steve Summers, his is got a big huge crack in it and he's kind of working on that now and he's making videos about it, which is interesting. He's also got a GoFundMe if you don't mind chucking a dollar in his direction just to help him with that project because uh, it looks quite big. It'll be interesting to follow it, see what he does. I shall provide a link to that down below. Right, this is where I'm having to be quite careful. These got very short leads. And the LED position, it's got the flat at one side, which is the negative. So I'm putting the positive in first into the other side. It's not sticking through much. It's quite tricky to solder, but that's all right. I'll definitely have to do these one at a time. And as a solder as well, the heat makes the plastic shrivel back a bit on the cable, which is also pretty common. I'm going to have to also make sure I don't touch the solder iron to the plastic and damage it. But this is going okay. The first couple you do are usually the trickiest. Just to get a feel for it, but that's the same with everything, isn't it? But yeah, Steve Summers, a uh, good channel, very interesting. It's one of my uh, relaxation channels. Like uh, South Main Auto. It's kind of fascinating if you're, say, like me, you're an electrician. It's kind of interesting. Your relaxation tends to be looking at other technical channels, but not in the same industry. A few of you will relate to that. But yeah. Next technical question. <clears throat> Let's uh, cook quite a lot here. Oh, Mark T. This is an odd one. Did I mention this before? Not really sure. Do you think circumcision is a good or bad thing? Hey, you said we could ask anything. You know, there's a really odd thing there. My dad was circumcised and I never knew why. Because uh, religion-wise, uh, he wasn't Jewish, as I'd normally associate that with. I just presumed it was some medical thing. But after my dad passed away, my brother raised an issue. He said that my dad's name, Frederick, was very German. And my dad looked German. He had that sort of, just that appearance that had a slight hint of Germanic background. And 
it just so happens that when my dad, the age of my dad is, is such that when he was a child, before he'd even have remembered things, uh, they had what they called the kinder transport from Germany. And they bulk shipped out Jewish children uh, to save them from the Holocaust. And suddenly me and my brother are going like, that's round about that age. It makes us wonder, was our dad adopted? Don't know. I suppose that technically speaking, we could go and get a, a DNA test. But the question is, would we even want to know? Would we want our lovely, smooth family background of known variables sort of disrupted in that way? Don't know. Maybe worth doing. I'll have to discuss that with Ralph. It would certainly be interesting knowing knowing a little twist of family history. Strange. But uh, I don't know other, any other reason. Did they routinely circumcise children round that era? I'm not really sure. The 1920s, 30s or something like that. I don't know. Uh, next question. Uh, boxers or briefs? Boxer shorts. Cotton boxer shorts. Just because I prefer a bit of loose, baggy room round there. I don't like tight. Tight panties. They're not comfortable. Chaffage. Sweating. So definitely loose boxer shorts. Which does make me think my mum helpfully got us boxer shorts and we didn't know what they were. We... we uh, Thought they were just, you know, up to that point that boxer shorts started becoming trendy. Uh, we were just wearing standard Y front underpants. So my mum gave me some boxer shorts and I promptly thought they were just shorts and wore them to the gym and wondered why all the women were staring at me. I guess the peony flap was probably a clue there. But anyway, these things happen. So that was John Carras, the boxers or briefs. Uh, J-K, J-K, J-A-Y-K-E. Do you have any experience with old CRT televisions? I've really swapped all of my TVs over to CRT and found them very, really robust with what they can handle and being well made inside. Also, have you experienced electronics lasting far longer than they have any right to? The old cathode ray tube televisions lasted a long time because they didn't really have mega switch mode power supply. They had high frequency power supplies inside, but not... Mega like switch modes like the modern era where the components are more stressed. But uh, the cathode ray tubes had that annoying 15 kilohertz whistle, certainly in the UK ones, of the flyback uh, transformer. And also they uh, were quite power hungry and the flicker was very obvious. If you go back to looking at cathode ray tubes now, you can see the flicker. You just get used to it at, back at the time. There was an interest trick you could do if you looked between your legs, if you bent over and looked between your legs, so you were looking at a TV upside down, you could really see the flicker, but your eyes had somehow just acclimatised to the flicker and got rid of it. This is all looking like it's going together pretty well. So cathode ray tubes, ooh, they're a blast in the past, they're interesting, they have their points, but you know, I'll stick to LCD. Ryan Coleman, what's the trick to soldering small leads and PCBs? For example, the GPI pins on the Pi Zero came unsoldered. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Uh, sometimes it's better pressing it into something like a bit of uh, breadboard to hold the pins correctly aligned, or just solder one in the middle while just uh, supporting the thing at the side so that as you solder it, you can then sort of nudge it and line it up by reflowing the solder like I was doing the LEDs. But then after you've got that one pin in the the thing is straight, uh, then you can solder along all those pins. Alignment is the hardest bit, probably. Let's stick another lead in here. Let's keep an eye on the time. You know what? It's 29, 29 minutes. I'm going to pause and start this video again. And it's restarted. All the uh, phones I've used to record stuff have done that thing that they stop and start after about 30 minutes. People think it's because uh, there is some regulation about camcorders that they want another bite at the pie, so to speak, so they charge more for camcorders that can record over 30 minutes. But in reality, 
It's always a nice round file size and it's often just a little bit over 30 minutes. So I think file size is the deciding factor on the mobile phones in their recording of video. Get the negative tucked in here. I will almost guaranteed get one round the wrong way at some point, but that's all right. These things can be fixed. I will try not to. Next question. Um, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Carnival Ben said, Hi Clive, I want to install some security lights in my garden at the back of the house and the driveway at the side of the house. I want to put several sensors around the place where any one single sensor will switch uh, the lights on. Uh, the the printout actually kind of misses a line here. But I think that's Carnival Car Ben saying is uh, wanting DMX control software for them. If I mix pages up here. Either way, the easiest way there, you can have multiple passive infrared sensors with the relay outputs. You can wire them in parallel so that any one of those sensors switching on will bring all the lights that are wired in that parallel circuit. So it's fairly straightforward to do. It's a useful feature to have at times. Next lead. I'm going to have to try and stuff these uh, all these connectors one at a time through this hole in the middle. I think it's going to be amply sized, but we'll find out when I do it. Where is the lead? Where is the lead? I'm currently soldering. I've just misplaced it. Oh, I'm going to have to look at the other side. They're very thin wires, these. Someone in a factory is just all day long, they're just putting these leads into these crimps. I hope it's a machine that's doing it. Given how cheap it is for these bunches of leads, I'd say it must be a machine that's doing it. They're only like a, a dollar or two for 50 leads, so blame you couldn't, you know, you can't really compete with that in, at all. I would guess it's a fair, fairly automated system that's stripping and crimping. Talking of crimps, I do have an absolute massive box of crimping tools next to me. And I will be doing a little uh, demo of crimping tools and which ones are best. And the good news is that so far, the expensive Engineer PA09, was it, is not actually the best. It's got slight drawback. The uh, crimps tend to stick in it quite easily. It's a sort of very common choice, but there is a Chinesey one that's uh, actually got more options, more crimping positions, and a nice sensible approach to the crimping. So we'll take a look at uh, some of those crimping tools and which are the best and we'll try crimps and then we'll give them a pull test to see how well they crimped in. But so far, I'm quite impressed at some of the crimping tools, particularly from one Chinese supplier, that one that I mentioned. I got a couple of tools from them. One was a ratchet type crimping tool and it's also very good. But a lot of the tools sold on eBay are kind of generic crimping tools that are not really dedicated to a particular crimp and uh, it means that some of them are, don't do quite as good a job as they could do. It's a compromise, but when you see the cost of the original tools, thousands, then it's a decent compromise. Okay, this is going to be very floppy, isn't it? Pop this lead in here. Time consuming, but you know, not unfun. Not too bad at all, quite enjoyable to do. I can't say it's going to look nicer then, but you know what? It is how it is. I'm being a bit overzealous here. I'm going to actually solder two leads at once, but this is a terrible idea because they're doing their best to pop right back out right now before I've had a chance to solder them. That's just greed. The perils of greed. Next question. Okay, let's uh, get that page out of the way. Um, do 
Dear Clive, I'm running about solar installation, says Robert, via my own self-building ancient camper van. 285 watt panel, 30 amp uh, MPPT, that's a sort of charge regulator thing. 12 volt, 160 amp hour battery, also integrating a Raspberry Pi into the mix. Why? With something called Venus developed by Victron. So I've done fit and wire and monitoring. 52 years old, no formal electrical qualification. like to get more into solar fuel and hopefully make some money. What to do? Cheapest and best route? Uh, just expect... Experiment. There are courses and such things, but where are there any good? Uh, if you get work with companies that do solar equipment installation, that's uh, good because then you're effectively getting paid to learn. And any fabulously expensive boo-boos at their expense, which is not necessarily a good thing. It's always better to train with companies because uh, who specialise in an area because they'll hopefully be able to teach you things you couldn't learn elsewhere. But you know what? Solar panels, uh, as long as it keep, you keep the voltage low, some are ridiculously high voltages they put out, um, and a nice simple control system with sensible wiring, it's, there's not a huge amount to go wrong. As long as you get suitable protection, because it does involve very high currents. And the downside of solar panels is they keep putting those currents out. Some of those uh, high voltage solar arrays are just a bit scary, because when something goes wrong, you can't just flick a switch and turn them off. Uh, as long as the sunshine is there, they'll keep pumping out current. And if you've got high voltage breakdown, then uh, that can lead to fire quite rapidly, as has been demonstrated by Elon Musk's solar roof systems that uh, he was putting out that have backfired slightly. I guess ultimately water may have been getting in somewhere or tracking. Um, the other problem there is that uh, Many of the people installing solar panels are roofers or they've done quick courses and they don't fully understand everything that can go wrong and they don't allow for them. Ew. Let's uh, try not to hit myself the solder iron. This is a very footry one to solder. But yeah, learning, learning on other people's dime is quite good really. Apprenticeships. You can effectively do an apprenticeship at any age. After my main apprenticeship, I worked with a company called Husman Refrigeration, and it was almost like a second apprenticeship in the control systems of refrigeration plant. It was fascinating. I really enjoyed it. It involved panel building as well, which was also very useful. For later on, for building my fairground controls, lighting control systems, because the skills picked up and... Uh, making the chassis up for the panels were very good. Daunting at first, but you know, once you've started, it all just falls into place. Much like uh, my first day with Hussman was out on a uh, supermarket, and I have to say it was really intimidating walking in at first and seeing just walls of controller panel, uh, control panels and all the really loud compressors running away. Fast forward, not too long, and uh, I was really comfortable working with this stuff and just knew everything and just intuitively. Very interesting company to work with. But uh, the company that owned them decided, uh, the Glasgow branch, I think they decided that, you know, they were going to make more money investing in other areas because it was all very investment driven. So uh, the company just sort of fizzled away and the guys I'd worked with there ended up uh, working with... Uh, a chain of supermarkets because they were very, very good at what they did. Yeah, good times actually at Hussman, although the hours were not pleasant. I've mentioned this before. Ed Neil Tonk says, the next generation of Diamond Lamp, what happened to it? Will it get another try? Will we ever get to see a shop tour? Oh, he's asking lots of questions. How do you sleep at night knowing your love of electronics is spreading? Uh, where the your obsession with LEDs came from. This is good. Everybody should be obsessed with LEDs. The diamond light. The diamond light is a... Uh, I made a few diamond lights, but I got the feeling that after I made a few of my sort of diamond light uh, lamps, that uh, that avenue of projects had been covered. I didn't want to make too many identical projects because otherwise it gets a bit boring. Although having said that, look at I'm making an LED lamp. Although having said that, this one is different. They're all uniquely different in their own way. Usually slightly dangerous, but different. 
That's the one thing they share in common. Mains voltage and danger often. These are very thin wires. Thinner than we used to. I guess that's probably an economy thing. Not perfect for high current circuitry and drones. So at this point in time, the coronavirus is still a big issue in China. I'm not sure that's going to affect things. Some people have been saying, are you worried about getting stuff from China? I'm more worried about the Chinese and their health, to be honest. Um, stuff that gets shipped, uh, most viruses can't really tolerate being away from their host for a few days. They need a host to support them. The body. Uh, so I'm not really too bothered about that aspect of it. I don't think it poses a huge risk. I think by the time a parcel finally arrives from China, that any virus that would have been on it will be absolutely dead. I'm not sure the mechanism of viral death in that process. Is it still some dry virus corpsey type thing? I'm not really sure. I don't look into viruses too much. Talk of which, I've got a, a Quack product. I'd love to show you the Quack product and take it to bits. But it does require running software on a laptop. And as it says that you have to remove your antivirus before installing that software, it doesn't instill much confidence. It makes you wonder, is it going to come with a little payload? Which, given the type of product, it wouldn't really surprise me. It's a quantum body scanner whereby you basically hold a couple of handheld electrodes and it scans your body, puts on a light show. It does some fancy computer graphics showing the scanner line going down a human body going pew, 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 and then it gives you a complex printout with all your health concerns that it's detected, which are actually based on a uh, little, uh, before you actually get your scan, they ask you lots of medical questions and type data in it just takes, takes statistical averages and then creates a report based on that. So say, for instance, if you were quite overweight and drank a lot and smoked, it would say, yes, your risk of heart failure is very high, according to our scan. In reality, it's just taken a sort of industry average from the health industry. Clever enough. Puts on the light show, gives you a medical result. And then I'm sure your practitioner, who's dishonest enough to give that service, would offer lots of treatment options. Maybe those uh, detox foot spas, for instance. Next question. Uh, Illidan Bain, honest question, what are your favourite colours? I tend to like darker colours like blue or black. Uh, that's about it, blue and black. Although uh, certain aspects, like say for instance American workwear, I quite like the Carhartt brown because it is symbolic of that particular thing. So I suppose it might be a preferred colour for different areas of different things. LEDs, I'm quite fond of warm whites and rich orangey reds, neon reds. I've only got one more lead to soldier in, and then we can build the circuit board and see if it disappears in a puff of smoke. I'm going to change one of the components in the circuit board to a lower value. It was a, this is designed as a sort of illumination lamp. I want it more as a decorative lamp. So I want the LEDs to be underrun just a little bit, and that will make them last a lot longer. So in goes the last LED, the extended LED lead, the little socket. These crimp sockets are fascinating because the little crimp that inserts into them, the area where it grips the cable that's getting crimped in is actually parallel but not in line with the actual... the pin that actually goes into it. So you can push a pin in here and it completely misses the wire. It'll come out the back of it um, and just stick out in thin air. It's a good way of making a very compact crimp. It does mean that if you're, you've got mains on them, like I'll have here, you have to make sure the leads are crimped down well, cropped down well, so they don't stick out the back. Because otherwise, it increases the risk of getting a little tingle. Okay. That is this bit finished.
Nice. Let's see if we can get these through. Am I going to regret this? I shall feed them through roughly one or two at a time. Or three at a time as I get more and more impatient. Yeah, they're going through okay, and it's leaving enough room with the wires to feed the others through, so this is working. I did make a fairly generous hole. I was going to stop. I was using the uh, cone cutter type thing, but I was going to stop earlier, but thought, nah, I'll leave a big hole because it's kind of better. So this is a clue of what it's going to look like, the blue LEDs in the base with the sort of little tendrils coming out with the flickering LEDs. Okay, on with the power supply. So the power supply is a bit weird. Normally you'd have a 10 ohm resistor on the main incoming supply to limit the current, uh, the inrush current, but they've actually got it going out to the LEDs. It's almost like someone didn't quite understand what was going on when they copied someone else's design. Here is a 470k resistor. That one is going to go in parallel with the drop capacitor. It's the safety discharge one that stops you getting a zing off the base of the lamp when you unplug it and it's holding a charge still. The spacing isn't generous. They really have the leads bent quite close to the components. More questions? Uh, Hub Ricks, could it be possible to throw an oscill oscilloscope in now and then? That would be useful for LED lightings and flickerings. I have a little printout somewhere up here because I was looking at a circuit recently. Where is it? Uh, have I buried it? Have I misplaced it? There it is. I was using a little uh, oscilloscope recently because I was monitoring the waveform being sent out to a water analyzer. And it was. It's a positive going pulse and a negative going pulse. It's quite clever the way they do that. That will be featured in another video. Oscilloscopes do occasionally get used in, but because this bench area isn't... Because you're looking straight down, it's not handy for the oscilloscopes. I'd like to use the Keysight oscilloscope more, but I basically have to clear the whole area. Put the oscilloscope, oscilloscope up on little pads to keep it off the bench to allow it to ventilate, because otherwise it would cover the vent ventilation slots at the back. And then it has to have a sort of dedicated setup for, for demonstrating the whatever I was actually monitoring. I will say that of the oscilloscopes I've got, a little um, pocket digital oscilloscope, which is a real, really footy. It's got two rotary encoders that also click in. And for big fingers like mine, it's just too few controls for uh, something like that. It just makes it quite hard to control it. And also it's very easy to click them while you're trying to rotate them. It's a bit annoying, actually. But that's a wee cheapy one. Then I've got an O1, my first uh, big digital oscilloscope. And the Keysight, which was generously sent by Keysight as a gift. And uh, by far the Keysight rather predictably has the best software. It's much better at auto-detecting a waveform, a complex waveform at that. And uh, setting all the ranges itself, and that is a big factor with uh, modern digital oscilloscopes because they have so many parameters. It's not like the old oscilloscopes, you had a couple of knobs and you just twisted it until you got the, the desired effect. It's a bit more complicated with digital ones. But the, the payoff for that is the fact they're so much more versatile. So this uh, other resistor I put in is another discharge resistor. It's for the capacitor. Now comes the bridge rectifier. And again, they've not left much space. It's a discrete bridge rectifier. Notable that the leads on the diodes are quite thin. Let's get these diodes around the right way. That would be very beneficial. I'll do them one at a time. Next question. What do you think about green sources of power in general? Wind, solar, or some might even say nuclear. Over in Australia, we're burning coal like crazy with no real plan for when our reserves run out. That surprises me for Australia, particularly places like Western Australia, where there isn't exactly a shortage of sunshine and that solar power would actually be viable. I'm surprised they're burning coal. I thought uh, they'd have a grid in Australia and just rely on the fact that they get a lot of sunshine. Or... Well, for most of the year, I think. How does that go in Australia? Do, is, it, is Australia large enough there's always going to be one bit that is going through a peak sunshine season? 
I know they have their uh, peak summer round about Christmas. They don't have snowy Christmases at all. It's all very bright sunshine. They're out having barbecues at Christmas time. Whereas here, it's always very dark in the winter. And this, uh, you couldn't really do solar panel here, as I've mentioned. It's not really... You do see houses with solar panels and they're like, oh yes, look, it's generating power. Not much. It's all hype. Artistic license with numbers. I'm going to get a bit more soda. I have more soda. Snap a bit off. Don't worry about the small bits, they will get used. Put this out of the way. Let's get the next diode in. The diodes are looking a bit rickety, but that's alright. They're fine. It's because the pin spacing is very close on the circuit board. It's not making it very easy to fold the leads and insert them. It's really, you have to bend them right tight against the body of it. Let's see if I can use that little last bit of solder by devious throwing in. Not the best position for the pads for using the last bit of solder, but let's give it a go. I usually save it for larger solder joints and then just sort of throw it into the solder joint once it's melted and the surface tension then pulls the rest of the solder in. But even with just a few millimetres of solder, that is that last bit of solder used up. Right. So last diode, that'll be the bridge rect for complete. Then the drop capacitor. Make sure you get this round the right way again. Double check. It's easier to double check now than later. Okay, so that's going under there. Yeah, it's going to the capacitor. Yep, mm -hmm. looking good. Next question. Um, some in-depth discussion says Ivan Voris about how and why you choose the exact components would be nice. Um, oh, that would be depending on... Well, I'll, I'll show you why I'm choosing one here. Um, I'm changing a component here because I want the LEDs to be run at lower current because they'll last longer. And I'm not wanting to use this to light the room. I'm just wanting a visual effect. So this originally came with a 470 nanofarad capacitor. Um, I'm putting in a suntan... 220 nanofarad capacitor, so less than half the value. But that'll still see at least 10 milliamps running through the LEDs. Possibly more. Possibly closer to 15 or 20 milliamps. Uh, let's put this big out-of-place resistor on. In the wrong place. It's in Sears, the LEDs. Not sure why they did this. Why have they done that? Don't know. But they've done it. Let's do it. I'd rather that had been an input. In the case of uh, this, it would be acting as an inrush limiter and a fuse because it would blow preferentially. But having said that, knowing what I've blown up already from China, the wires will probably blow inside the plug, the, uh, the lamp base. Crop those leads. Let's get to, uh, I tend to work from the smallest components up to the biggest, so I'm going to put in the electrolytic next. And this is the also polarised, but this is a more violent polarised one. If you get it wrong, it will often blow its lid off with a loud pop and spew stuff out. So that's going in like that. I've folded those leads quite close to the body. It's recommended to leave a wee bit of space from the body capacitor just to avoid stress. But having said that, it's up at a, it's on its side. It's not end on into the circuit board. But choice of components, uh, also quality wise, I wouldn't use cheap components from eBay for a professional product. I would tend to go for local to local distributors for that because I want consistency and reliability and I want to cover my ass in the event of something going horribly wrong. Cover your ass, it's good advice. Make sure you've got a 
other means of transferring liability onto other suppliers if, to make sure you know they would choose to test those components when they came into the country. You really don't know what you're getting if you would buy from a random Chinese seller. Although uh, there's lots of advantages to buying stuff from China. It's great for prototyping and experimenting and learning because it is so cheap. Just not so great for professional applications where there is a risk of stuff happening. I've got a couple of little red and black leads here. Positive and negative. Let's stick the negative in. And then that will go onto the circuit board. We're very close to being able to plug this light in and see at the very least initially get the blue LEDs lit if they do work. They might not work. Only one way to find out, and that's to plug it in. If stuff goes bang, it goes bang. It's what can you do about it? It's not so bad when it's some cheap crap like this, but if it's a really expensive thing that you're working on that goes bang, and if it happens in front of the customer, then it's not so good. Has happened. <laughs> Awkward. What have you done to my light? Oh, it, it's going to be fine. Okay. So let's tin these leads. They are already tin, but I'm just going to put some of my preferred lead-based solder on because it works better than your epoxy lead-free solder. And I'm going to tin the appropriate pads on here. So there is the negative pad. There is the positive pad. So let's flow that lead on there, while not desoldering the lead next to it. And let's solder that lead there. I could have zoomed in for this, but I've said that. It's just an ambient project. Yeah, I don't want to... If I zoom in, there's a risk that I'm going to go off shot too much or go out of focus or something like that. Right, where's the base? The base. Let's poke the lead through from the base into the circuit board this side, one lead is going straight to the bridge rectifier, the other is going via the capacitor. The capacitor will limit the damage if something goes horribly wrong. The, not the electrolytic capacitor, but the red capacitor, the capacitive drop capacitor. If there's a dead short on the other side of that, it doesn't really matter because it will limit the current each half. It'll just let a fresh capacitor across the mains. This current will flow, but it won't be too dramatic. Oh, this is a bit fumbly. This is a bit fumbly. Go. Go through the hole. There it goes. I am drinking a dark, dark and stormy tonight. But uh, it's made with Sainsbury's ginger beer because the local supermarket, ShopRite, has realigned. It's now getting a load of Sainsbury's branded stuff in. They've done some sort of deal with Sainsbury's. Right. Before I put the flickering LEDs in, I should try this out. So where is my Edison screw lead? Hold on. Dark and stormy. Mmm. Darker colour. Mm. Still tastes like ginger beer to me and probably comes from the same factory. Right, let's screw this in. Quick double check to make sure I've not done something absolutely terrible. And when I plug this in, one of two things will happen. The LEDs, blue, blue LEDs will light up, or nothing will happen for by a loud bang from the electrolytic. Or some of the LEDs will light up and others don't. I shall take the solder out of the way and all the component trimmings out of the way first. Because uh, I have shorted stuff on component trimmings before. Right, let's plug it in. The blue LEDs have lit up. All the blue LEDs are lit. This is looking good so far. Righty-o. So at this point, I can unplug it. I can stuff this little circuit board. Is it discharged yet? Mm. Yes, it has. I can stuff it down into the base. 
Uh, I really feel I should have some insulation between these areas. I shall cut a bit of plastic or stick a bit of card, something flammable. That would be a good idea. Uh, how's the time? Am I going to scroll up? Yeah, hold on, I'm going to have to stop and start again. And continue. That means this has just rolled over the one hour mark. That's ridiculous. It is a chill out video, very much a grab a drink, chill out and uh, use it to help put you to sleep type of video. So I'm going to put this in. I've put a bit of heat shrink uh, sleeve just, I could have put that over the power supply in there. But in this case, I'm just going to use it in front of it. I'm going to try and squish the circuit board in. Is the circuit board going to fit? Yes, it is. Is the little cap going to snap in? Hold on, may I have to unscrew this to do this? So I can get my hand around it properly. I've found these to be quite a tight fit in the past. I don't think this is going to be any different. Loud click noise when it goes in. Ah, there we go. Okay, right, let's crop some of these uh, LEDs. These flickering LEDs. Is this going to work? Uh, one other important thing to note. When you've got, say for instance, the blue LED. Uh, let's get the power supply in. And let's put it, say, 10 milliamps. So the blue LED is going to light up. The voltage across the blue LED must be high enough to allow the flickering LED to work. So I couldn't do that with a red LED because the voltage would be too low. So at this point in time, the current is now being shared between the flickering LED and the blue LED because they're in parallel. If I'd used... Where is a red LED? I've got one here. If I'd used a red LED with a much lower forward voltage like this, so the red LED is lighting, and I put the green flickering LED across it. Uh, the green LED just can't light because the voltage across it is too low. The red is hogging the current, it's pulling the voltage down to 2 volts, so that green LED will not light. That's worth mentioning. Could catch you out. Let's crop some of these short-ish, going to crop them to about 6mm, a quarter of an inch, so that they go into these connectors, but they don't protrude out the back, so they sort of make a good connection. The long lead is going to the small terminal, and the negative is going to the big terminal in these, so that's a good way to know that the black wire on this is going to the large terminal inside the LED. I could plug one LED and I could test that. Hold on, let's do that. Let's plug it in and see if that LED flickers. The LED is flickering. And its matching LED down the base is probably just shimmering in intensity too. Where is its matching LED in the base, said Clive, fingering the live wires. Uh, it's one of these two, but I'm not seeing them flicker too much. Oh, I am, it's that one. It's good undulating up and down brightness. Okay, let's cram more LEDs in. This is quite a nice project, I have to say. It's laid back. It's not going to have a terrible power consumption. It's going to be the sort of thing could leave running all the time, but it'll just do some weird stuff. The pleasure of adapting things to, to do unusual things. The one thing I've not found on eBay is proper warm white flickering candle LEDs, but a nice golden warm white. They're usually a horrible pussy green colour. But you get what you get. Cold white flickering LEDs are just not candle-like at all. Then again, I suppose neither is blue. Or green, or red. And the yellow always looks a bit ferocious. I wish they'd just kind of make flickering LEDs in sort of candly colours. That'd be quite nice. It'd be more convincing. Quite liking these as little LED holders. I may feature them in other projects. Now that I've found a crimper that does reliably crimp the absolutely microscopic uh, terminals in these quite easily-ish. They're very fumbly to get in with their uh, big fingers, but hey, that's just how it is with big fingers, isn't it? Particularly when they're not noted for fine work. Not exactly pianist's fingers. So, negative... I'll just crop all the other LEDs that I'm putting into this and put them in before I plug it in again. And then we'll check the power consumption. And look at its appalling power factor, which is almost guaranteed. 
but at the power consumption this is going to take it doesn't really matter too much so I shall sweep these leads out the way and grab these uh, so the choice of components yeah it will depend on uh, your project whether it's sort of high profile or just a hobby project let us uh, look at the next questions Uh, can a plant power a selfie? London apparently has the world's first and it's getting glowing reviews. Have I had a chance to do any Pepper's Ghost effects in the work with theme parks? My little RGB controllers have a Pepper's Ghost functionality in them that they'll uh, go back or some forest between two channels. Uh, did we use Pepper's Ghost in any of the attractions I worked on? No, I don't think we did. Uh, no, it was all done with more, shall we say, modern effects. CGI. Computer-generated images. Uh, the plant-powered selfie, that sounds fake to me. That sounds like the classic thing where they stick some electrodes in some soil. But what's really generating the power is uh, the two different, different metal the electrodes. It's like these lemon batteries. It's not the lemon that's generating the power. It's the copper and zinc, is it? They use electrodes that are gradually dissolving away that generates the power. And likewise, that plant-powered selfie, that's probably using something like that. And the power it generates probably isn't enough. So the, it's probably faked. Call me cynical, if you will. They could use it to show it's trickle charging a power bank, but off shot, the power bank is being charged up from the wall. This is not going in. Oh, there it goes. It was just slightly misaligned. Yeah, I've come across these things, these ambitious statements they make of art exhibits where it's all just a little tiny bit fake. Probably because the project started off them believing they could actually do it, and then when they discovered they couldn't, they had to find a way around it. It's like these eco-warrior, uh, hey, come to our solar-powered disco rave and out the back is a generator running to keep it all powered because the solar panel or the little tiny wind turbine out the front has absolutely no hope of doing anything other than being a nice visual effect. How many more do I need here? Uh, that's one, two, three, four, five. I need six more. So just one more out the bag, and the lamp will be complete. I could have mixed the flickering LEDs. It would have been interesting using the yellow or red ones, because they'd have made the blue ones dip uh, a lot uh, darker when, they, uh, when the flickering LED was drawing. When it was at full intensity, it would pull the voltage down to the point the other LED would go out if it was a uh, lower voltage. Ramble, ramble, mumble, mumble, things just going through my mind. Almost there. Do I have time for another question here? Um, oh, I vaguely recall. Demolished Man says, so that was JB asking about the power of selfie. Demolished Man, I vaguely remember you mentioning you wanted to investigate the weather forecast built to the Fitzroy storm glass. Did I miss here? I have one purchase from maybe which did nothing at first, but after many cycles of warmth and vibration, now produces one of the crystals, but nothing I'd stick the umbrella on. It's a system, it's a, a sort of globe that is full of chemicals that have different solubilities at different temperatures. And it is purely thermal cycling, but it forms crystal growths inside. It's very slow. I did mean to make a project about out of it, but it's one of these things that to properly test it, it's had to be left for a year running. So I've got a whole load of these things I've made up and they're working very well. The one I got from China on eBay is shit compared to the ones I've made. It doesn't do much, but mines have, mine have made up for that well and truly by uh, producing great results. And you can do it in a plastic bottle. It doesn't have to be a sealed glass bottle. Right, this is complete. How is it going to look? Is it going to look rubbish? I'll bring the hoppy up. And I'll turn the light off, which means the hoppy will suddenly come into non-flickery mode. So, let's start off. It'll be flickery initially. 
Now we'll let them all go out of sync a little bit. We'll just splay them about a bit, try not to get a zap off in the process because this is slightly shady. That one is not lit. Why? Oh, there it goes. Oh, bad contact maybe. Uh, power consumption is one watt. Power factor is a miserable point too, which is expected. It's fine. Let's take the exposure off and uh, we'll see how this looks. That is interesting. Let's, uh, can we focus down onto this area? Is it going to, okay. Let's see if I can just nudge the exposure to try and let you see what I'm seeing here, which is about that. What do you reckon? It's an interesting effect. I particularly like the way it focuses the dots. So it's putting out that splash of blue and then it's producing all these dots which are just undulating and flickering. That's quite an interesting effect. Each one doing its own thing. The blue is undulating uh, as the green shares the load in parallel, but it's not really anything really obviously visible. It's a good, good effect. I quite like that. It's unusual. I shall stick it in a lamp holder somewhere and just leave it on and see see what I think of it. It certainly adds a lot of movement. It's slightly restless, but it's not too bad. Particularly the fact you've got a lot of them all doing it at once. It's not like just one flickering on up and down. So that is quite a good result. I like that. And that then ultimately means the video is now complete because I have made something out of trash. Something interesting. Uh, and that's it. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this project, if it was a complete waste of time or if it was a relatively amusing time time consumer. But there we go. The, uh, I don't even know what to call it, the random junk flickering LED light thing. So that's it. Good result, I'd say.